Just to make one thing absolutely clear at the start of this video, and that is that this video is not intended to unnecessarily or unjustly criticise the English and Welsh court system or solicitors or barristers across the country. But it is to give you a little bit of an insight from my personal perspective and experience, both as a consumer, as a business owner and as a barrister who has represented clients in civil courts and criminal courts across the country. So let's go right back to the very beginning to when either of these cases start, whether that is a criminal case or a civil case. Let's start with civil cases. When two parties have a dispute, now that might be an individual and a business, or two businesses or two individuals between each other, it matters not. It only matters when it comes to going to court and the size of each representative party, the money they are able to throw at the legal representation, or whether they are going by themselves. But either way, they will have a dispute between each other, and the first thing they might do is call a lawyer that they might know of, either through a friend or maybe the lawyer that helped them to sell their house in the first place. This seems to be particularly prevalent in my experience with individuals that have never had any other dealing with law before, other than perhaps the need of a solicitor to do the conveyancing for the sale of their property, or something like that. So typically an individual will call the solicitor that they've always dealt with for either the sale of their property or a will or some what I might call a fairly routine legal process, such as the conveyancing of a house or drafting of a will. Now in many cases that solicitor will be obliged to take the case on because it is technically within their scope and remit and their expertise because it may not be a particularly complicated case so they'll need to take it on. However, it may not be their core business. In other words, they may not typically handle these kind of cases. They may typically only handle conveyancing for property or drafting of wills. But either way, the individual is going to go to the solicitor, pay their hourly rate, and they will start drafting letters. Very often, these letters will go back and forth between the parties for weeks or even months trying to reach some kind of resolution. Because after all, the court system should be a last resort. In fact, the courts will very much encourage you to think of it as a last resort. Why? Because it is always much better that parties resolve issues between themselves. And secondly, going to court does take a lot of time. It is a little bit more adversarial. There is a decision at the end of it. So it's a decision that you get, not a decision that you choose. So it is always better to deal with each other to try to get a resolution. And indeed, under the civil procedure rules, parties are under an obligation to cooperate with each other to try to resolve matters between each other before the matter gets to court. However, what can happen is that this can go back and forth for many months and cost many thousands of pounds without any kind of resolution. Now, to that end, the Money Claim Online system has been set up to try to facilitate claims to go through the system as quickly and efficiently as possible. It allows individuals to set out a timeline, a chronology of events and details of what happened on the system. This system will then produce what is usually referred to as a particulars of claim. Particulars mean going into the detail, claim obviously your claim against the other party for money or whatever it is. But obviously for the Money Claim Online system, it is limited to a claim for money. However, in one very real experience that I have had when I've stepped in to represent a client going against a company, the company through their in-house litigator, their in-house solicitor, they criticised my client's way of presenting the case because it was done with the Money Claim Online system. They asked the court to strike out the claim on the basis that it didn't make sense because essentially it just amounted to a chronology. But of course it amounted to a chronology because that's what the system asked my client to do and to prepare. However, the matter did find its way to court some months later and the judge in the case gave consideration to the request of the company to strike out this case. Now, to be fair to the judge, the judge did not strike out the case, but what the judge did say is that the claimant should redraft this particulars of claim so that it makes more sense. And that's of course the point that I stepped in. So I then took what essentially was a chronology produced by the Money Claim Online system. And then I turned that into a proper particulars of claim, which could then go back before the court and to the company involved so that they could draft an adequate defense to it. Meanwhile, several more months had passed because it takes time to get any response from the court 
to get any hearing date from the court and then for it to be considered. And obviously then you get deadlines within which you have to come back with the amended documents. But then let's say you get to court one day having not really understood the documents that have come out to you, which have told you to prepare a witness statement of evidence and everything else. But in your mind, and this is speaking from experience from clients that have told me that this happened to them, some of them believed that because they've set their case out in the first place, they didn't need to do it again in the form of a witness statement. But of course, that's not true because your initial statement of case, your initial particulars of claim, setting out your claim against the other party, is what the court first sees to set out your claim. Your evidence comes later, usually in the form of a witness statement. However, again, some companies will take advantage of this and ask the court to strike out the claim because you haven't complied with filing the witness evidence that you're required to do by one of the court orders and indeed by the civil procedure rules. And in many cases, this is successful, in which case you've wasted all that time and all that money because you didn't follow the court orders because you probably didn't understand them. But let's skip forward a lot further. Let's say you've gone all the way through the court process, you've got your judgment and you've perhaps paid some lawyer's fees along the way, which by the way, you can't claim back if your claim was for not more than £10,000, which is the cutoff point for a small claims track allocation. And within the small claims track, you cannot ordinarily claim back your lawyer's fees from the other side. You can only claim back your fixed costs. That's the cost when you issue the claim in the first place and the cost of the hearing, which is usually a few hundred pounds. But let's say you've done all that and you've got your judgment. You've got an order sealed by the court, which is ordering the other party to pay you the money. That might be an individual. It might be a company. Now, again, in more than one very real case, my clients have had a judgment in hand and they're trying to enforce it against the company. And there are only a limited number of ways of doing this, although you can exercise more than one at the same time. There is a writ or a warrant of control, in which case you can get bailiffs to go and try to take control of goods. But this doesn't really work if the only address you've got for the company is some post box registered address at some building that registers thousands of other companies. And actually, very often you go there and they haven't heard of the company or they paid once years ago and they haven't paid since, but they still use that as a registered address. In which case, of course, the bailiffs cannot take anything because the company doesn't look like it's belonged there. In another case, let's say you've got bailiffs turning up at the address and you know that they used to trade there, perhaps they had a shop front there, but on the front of that shop front, the name has now changed. The bailiffs go in and ask questions and they say, no, we are not that company, we are this company. So ostensibly, the company is a different company. The bailiffs then again cannot take those goods because on the surface they belong to a different company. Let's take another option where you might be able to get a charging order against a property that belongs to the company. Well, that's all well and good as long as you have details of a building that belongs to the company against which you have the judgment which on the surface is probably unlikely. Another alternative is a third party debt order. If you are lucky enough to have the bank details of the company that you have the judgment against, you can then go back to the court and ask the court to make an order against the bank to release money to you because you have an order that that company pay you the money. It's called a third party debt order because of the way money is arranged between bank and their customer, i.e. the other business involved. The bank is essentially a third party in this arrangement, so the court can order the bank to freeze some of that money. But then let's break this down a little bit more. It isn't just as simple as filing one document and you get the money. You have to file an application for a third party debt order, which by the way, on more than one occasion, I've been waiting many, many weeks, if not months, to receive a response from the court to my application for a third party debt order on behalf of a client. But let's say you file that application, which by the way, you can do without notice. You don't need to tell the company that you are making this third party debt order because obviously that would tip them off and they might change the bank account. But let's say the court looks at this document and they say, okay, on the surface, you owed the money. It looks like they have a bank account that might have money in it. Let's temporarily put a freeze on that money if there is any. So they will temporarily order the bank to freeze any money that covers the debt amount within the judgment and they'll send that off to the bank as well. But that's not the end of the story. You still need to come back to court to argue that this order should be made final and that the bank should finally be ordered to pay you the money. That's all well and good, but if you've got an individual arguing this, they may come back to court and argue hardship. In other words, they need money on a day-to-day -day basis to live. And if the only money in their account is money they need to live, 
they are likely to get a hardship order, which means, again, you don't get the money. But let's take another scenario where we have got the third party debt order against the bank. I'm speaking from experience now. One major national bank against whom one of my clients had a third party debt order, the bank simply didn't pay the money. Weeks went by and they simply didn't pay the money. The bank was essentially in contempt of court because they hadn't paid my client the money. Many, many emails later, the bank stopped responding. So what do you do now when you have an order from the court against the bank to pay the money, but the bank have refused to pay the money? The client then has to come back to the lawyer paying yet more fees unless they can do it themselves, which with respect is probably quite difficult for then the lawyer to draft an application to hold the board of directors of the bank in contempt of court and ask the court to send the directors to prison. Unsurprisingly, upon sending a draft of this application to the bank, the bank capitulated and finally sent the money to my client. So let's give this a little bit of a time frame. In a small claim worth not more than £10,000, it's taken, on average, my clients two to three years to get from the starting point of issuing a claim, getting it heard in court, and getting anywhere by way of enforcing a judgment. However, in some of those cases, the money recovered from the bank was only really enough to cover lawyers' fees, which in any event, the client is not going to get back because it was a small claim in the first place. So coming full circle, this is probably the fundamental reason I created my sister channel, Black Belt Barrister, which is linked in the description below, to help anyone and everyone watching these videos to get some kind of guidance on how to navigate through the legal system, how to navigate through problems, how hopefully to achieve a resolution with the other party without having to go to a lawyer, without having to go to court. But if you do have to go to court so that at least you will understand the legal system a little bit better. So before this video gets far, far too long, I'm going to mark this video as part one and I will come back to talk about the criminal side of things because you probably guessed it, in many cases, it's not just as bad as the civil system, it can be worse. So in the meantime, please make sure you subscribe. Subscribe to Black Belt Barrister, which is linked in the description below. And please also give this video a big thumbs up if you like this free guidance and information. And as always, thank you for watching.